11, the lucky time uh, down below. So let's get started. Welcome everybody to the Natural Working Lands Breakout uh, Group session. Um, I'm Nick Lund. I'm the Outreach and Network Manager for Maine Audubon. Um, I'm joined by Matt Cannon, the Campaign and Policy Associate Director for the Maine Chapter of the Sierra Club. Um, hello. And of course, we uh, are joined again by Eliza Donahue, um, who you just heard from on the larger webinar. Uh, she is the Director of Advocacy and the Staff Attorney for Maine Audubon. Um, so we'll turn it over to her just quickly, Julian. Um, we disabled the video um, in the past. There have been people putting the wrong things on their video screens. And so it's just a safety thing that we do. Um, so Eliza, if you want to, um, if there are any questions right now, you want to start posing, I can um, throw them to Eliza. Otherwise, Eliza, if you want to start with maybe just a brief overview again of uh, the working group and your role, um, that would be a great start. Yeah, let's see. Uh, I'm trying to think of something to add um, that wasn't already uh, included in the earlier portion of the webinar. Um, but uh, I would say that uh, I see some familiar uh, names uh, part, as part of the chat today. Um, and uh, some of those names are particularly familiar because they have been part of uh, they've contributed to the public process that have helped the Natural Working Lands Working Group arrived at the strategies in their draft form as they are today. So um, big thanks to the many of you who have um, sat in on the climate counselor, excuse me, on the working group meetings, who have um, given public comment and who have given written comment. Um, we are in the process of reviewing those written comments right now um, and incorporating them into the strategies that we will ultimately deliver to the Climate Council uh, at the end of June or in mid-June. Um, Eliza, could you talk a little bit about some of the discussions between group members? Um, maybe some of the um, sticking points or points where there's been um, a lot of agreement right off the bat. Um, and again, yeah. if you have questions, please type them into the chat. Uh, down below. Thanks. Um, well, I would say, you know, I haven't been following the other working groups super closely, um, so it's hard for me to um, make specific comparisons, but what has been really wonderful about our working group is that we're generally in pretty good agreement about most things. Um, even though there is a diversity of interests, really, even if you are kind of coming towards this um, topic area from a different perspective, uh, as I mentioned during the webinar, pretty much the very similar strategies help you get to the same outcome. So for instance, you know, a lot of what this comes down to is working to strategically keep our forests as forests and keep our farms as farms. With those are kind of two elemental things that um, if as we kind of move along from there, um, we can arrive at um, uh, strategies with a lot of uh, commonality. Great, thanks. Um, and I see a few more folks joining. Uh, for the folks who've joined after we've started, um, welcome. I'm Nick Lund from Maine Audubon, joined by Matt Cannon from Sierra Club, uh, the Maine chapter of Sierra Club, and of course, Eliza Donahue from Maine Audubon. If you have questions for Eliza about her work on the Natural Working Lands uh, Working Group of the Maine Climate Council, please type them in the chat down below and we can relay them on. Um, Eliza, I'm wondering if you could um, talk a little bit more about the, the first strategy, draft strategy that you, the team has come up with, which is um, a sustained funding source to conserve working forest, agricultural, and natural lands. Um, could you tell just a little bit more about um, the thought behind that and maybe some of the discussion that went into it? Yeah, so um, this gets back to the general idea that for us to um, achieve our vision, we ultimately need to keep forests as forests and farms as farms. And a great way to do that is either by purchasing lands in fee um, or putting conservation easements on land. Maine has a great history um, of supporting um, land conservation, particularly through our Land for Maine's Future program. Um, but unfortunately, more recently, funding for that program and the other programs that help uh, support uh, either land acquisition or the acquisition of conservation 
easements has been inconsistent. Um, what we're advocating for um, is having a more stable funding source so that those same goals can be uh, implemented more regularly. Um, and also, not just more regularly, but more strategically. Um, often the organizations that help to um, negotiate these land acquisitions or um, help to put in place these conservation easements, they work on really extended timelines. Um, and they uh, really benefit from having a stable funding source, um, as we have in the past had a stable funding source, for instance, um, of federal money. So we're looking to at the idea of creating a stable funding source uh, from the state. Okay, um, thanks. So we have some questions, so I'll turn it over to Matt now. Yeah, um, looks like from Ken. The New England Food Division calls for Maine to grow a lot more food as New England moves towards 50% food self-reliance. How can Maine do this without clearing massive amounts of woodlands? Yeah, um, well, I'll first acknowledge that I am not the expert on um, the strategies that have specifically to do with agriculture, um, but that your question does bring up a good point about where there has, I'm, hesitant to put, say, conflict, because I think it, it um, suggests disagreement, but where there has been, um, we've understood that we need to do a balancing of interests. Um, and the one that you say in particular um, is, uh, is a, has the potential to be uh, a, com uh, a conflict. So that is a continued discussion around the working groups. And certainly as these strategies move to um, the Climate Council, and then if there is, for instance, a, um, a particular policy solution, there will be advocates that are working collaboratively to make sure that we achieve that right balance. But when it comes from, when, if you're thinking about this from um, strictly a climate mitigation perspective, farms stand to sequester a lot of carbon the same way that um, forests stand to sequester um, a lot of carbon. So it's um, no matter what the outcome from a land use perspective, it's a win for climate. Thanks, Eliza. I, I have a question here from Gina, um, who asks about um, sort of generally, do we work with land trusts a lot and maybe the, the role of land trusts um, going forward potentially? Nick, can you repeat um, if her question, the beginning part of that question? Well, she said, uh, do you work with land trusts a lot? Um, easements seem like a big deal, uh, especially the one in Harpswell, and they check the easements annually somehow. Yeah, um, there, uh, I certainly in my role at, at Maine Audubon work um, with the land trust community quite a bit. Um, the land trust community um, is definitely represented on the working group um, and has also otherwise uh, contributed to the um, contributed to the strategies um, through the process as well. So yes, um, I anticipate um, that land trusts are going to play a uh, big role in helping us achieve the strategies that come out of the Natural and Working Lands Working Group. Matt, go ahead, you wanna take this one? Uh, sure, yeah, so question from Sandy and I know um, I'm familiar with this as the Sierra Club Woods team has been working on this a little bit, but Eliza, has there been some progress on finding compelling ways to compensate large and small scale landowners for managing their property to maximize carbon over time? The answer is yes. Um, and while I uh, am really hesitant to um, say anything about the final strategies that are coming out of um, out of the Natural and Working Lands Working Group or, or characterizing them as final, I uh, strongly suspect that among those strategies is creating a, a carbon program, particularly one that, uh, that targets smaller landowners. Um, you know, as I referred to earlier, um, you know, we've got a pretty good, we have pretty good systems in place um, to help support landowners in uh, both managing their land with carbon in mind and compensating them for uh, for management practices that help increase carbon. But to date, 
uh, in Maine, small landowners have been left out um, of, or there have been barriers that have prevented small landowners from uh, taking advantage of those programs. And that is, uh, I anticipate that that will be among the, the recommendations coming out of the working group. Thanks, Eliza. Uh, and again, for the few folks who joined uh, just a moment ago, um, if you have a question for Eliza Donahue on the Natural and Working Lands Working Group, please put it in the chat uh, below and we will pass that on. Um, is Maine Audubon hiring? Uh, good question. Check our website, uh, mainaudubon.org. I'm not sure. <laughs> um, uh, Eliza, I'm wondering, so you, you um, touched just now uh, with the question from Sandy Buck on the, um, the financial assistance piece. Could you talk a little bit more about uh, what the working group is talking about uh, or considering potentially for other um, financial assistance programs or, or similar, sort of your draft uh, strategy number two? Yeah, um, so one that um, I was alluding to in the second recommendation that I talked about was taking a look at Maine's current use taxation program. Right now, um, a variety of types of landowners can have their uh, lands assessed at a lower valuation. Um, that's an incentive for um, them to either keep their lands in forest management, to keep them in farmland, uh, to keep them otherwise in open space. Um, that program is working, particularly Maine's um, tree growth program, tree growth taxation program. That's a, a big part of, um, of you know, the many things that make Maine's forest products industry successful. Um, and while I, you know, there's general agreement that the other, or at least many aspects of the other current use taxation program are working, there's a lot of room for improvement particularly room for improvement that are climate specific. So uh, I also anticipate that there will be a recommendation having to do with taking a closer look at Maine's current use taxation program and thinking about how it can um, incentivize more people to enroll in that program, um, how it can better target management um, with climate in mind, uh, and also how it can be done uh, in an equitable way. Um, obviously, that means, um, or it can mean that there's less, less money flowing from landowners to their particular municipality, and that strategy does not work um, unless its um, costs and benefits are reviewed holistically. Eliza, a uh, question from Henrietta. Are there any strategies directed towards reforesting cleared lands? That's a really good um, question, Henrietta. Um, and you know, for anyone who uh, has done some reading on natural climate solutions, um, reforestation is your best bet for um, increasing stored carbon. You know, putting trees where they haven't been before. Um, I think it was actually in Jeff Mark's presentation um, that he. Uh, shared that Maine is 90% forested already. That's great news. Um, I, I tend to think that um, because we already have so much forest land, that that's not going to be a really top priority. Um, but I think that there's a lot more learning that needs to be done, and we can't discount the opportunity for reforestation um, when it makes sense. Thanks, Eliza. Um, I have a question from Sandy Buck, and then following that is a question from Kimberly. Um, Sandy asks, has there been some focus on protecting riparian habitat in cold water streams? That's another great question. And actually, um, there has been a bit of conversation or a good amount of conversation about connecting, um, connecting our waterways, making sure that they are passable for both fish and wildlife but there hasn't been, um, in reviewing the whole strategies, there haven't been specific, there to date is not a specific strategy related to cold water fisheries. Um, and the working group has received a lot of feedback on that. And I anticipate that that is going to be a change that we make um, to really to tune our strategies so that they are um, more, uh, speak more, to uh, cold water fisheries. All that said, 
um, even though some of these strategies might not specifically address cold water fisheries, uh, any strategy that works to keep forests on the land, those forests that create the shade that we need to keep those streams cold, um, is going to ultimately help um, those habitats. Thanks, Eliza. Um, a related question from Kimberly. Um, our pristine waters are such a valuable and important resource. Is watershed preservation being considered by this group? Yes, absolutely. Um, I, as folks know, the headwaters for um, many of the, or much, if not all of the water that Mainers drink um, are within our forests. And so that's a, a great example of the co-benefits co of, uh, of maintaining Maine's existing um, forest cover is that um, forests play a, a really big role in keeping our water clean. So that's certainly um, what I anticipate. And again, I don't want to get ahead of the working group because it's really important that that um, ultimately comes from um, the entirety of the working group. But when we start thinking about um, how we prioritize um, land conservation, it's my hope um, that we look for opportunities to put a stronger focus on, uh, on prioritizing parcels that are going to help us um, maintain or improve water quality. Thanks, Eliza. Um, just a reminder for folks, we're scheduled to go till 1.30, which is in about three minutes. Um, if we have a bunch of, a flood of questions, um, I, I think I can convince Eliza to stick on to answer them quickly. But um, until then, I wanna just, uh, with the few minutes we have left, ask Eliza just to maybe recap a little bit the, the, next, the steps forward for folks. Uh, I know it's been covered a time or two, but um, if you just wanna remind folks of uh, where you are all in the process and uh, what the council will be doing next. Yeah, um, I wish I had that handy slide available here. And if you guys will bear with me, I can see if I can uh, find it. And maybe while I'm looking for it, I will talk about um, the stuff that is specific to the working group. So the working group is um, in the process of wrapping up our work. Um, I also mentioned earlier that we um, had a public comment process. I'm really psyched that uh, a lot of people got back to us and we are now, or will soon be in the process of incorporating those comments into our recommendations. So the National Working Lands Group will soon be delivering our recommendations to the Climate Council, um, but obviously we won't be done there. Uh, in the summer, in July, in August, there will be more opportunities for people to give public input to the Maine Climate Council. Uh, and then there will be, again, in, uh, in the fall, another opportunity for people to, to give feedback. So I really encourage folks to um, stay in touch with the Maine Climate Council. You can go, if you Google Maine Climate Council, the website comes up fairly readily and you can sign up for email alerts. Um, but also organizations like Sierra Club, like Maine Audubon, um, we, are, we are and plan to continue to alert our mailing list to when there are opportunities for the public to be engaged because this is not going to work um, if people don't like what we're doing. Um, and we can only uh, do, uh, we can only achieve that best result um, if the, as many people as possible um, contribute uh, their thoughts. Thank you. Um, so I, I don't see any uh, final questions for Eliza um, and we are at time at 1.30. So um, I wanna thank everyone for joining. If you do have additional questions, uh, feel free to e email them to uh, Maine Audubon at uh, advocacy at maineaudubon.org. Um, and Matt, I'm not sure what email uh, might work for you out there. Um, yeah, sure. Um, Maine.chapter at sierraclub.org is the easiest way to get in touch with me. Great. Well, so uh, we're going to call it a day here. Thank you all for joining us. Um, I want to thank Matt Cannon from Sierra Club Maine and, of course, Eliza Donahue, my colleague at Maine Audubon. 
Um, thank you all for your interest in this issue and for your attention. And I hope we, uh, you'll keep it going throughout the process and will result in a, in a great final plan. Thanks very much. Thank you, everyone.